Jesse. Amen. All right, if you have your Bible this morning, took, turn to the book of Galatians, chapter number 6, verse 1. We'll title the message today, Stone Throwers versus Restorers. Kind of rhymes, doesn't it? Stone Throwers versus Restorers. Galatians 6, 1. Brethren, so who are we talking to here now? We get the context of it, it's very clear. Brethren. And uh, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, we're indebted to the Bible to define spirituality, aren't we? Restore such an one the spirit of meekness. Notice how the spirits are attached to certain attitudes of your body and your mind and your soul. Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ, who introduced a law that was far greater than any of the Ten Commandments, for he was the absolute fulfillment of the Ten Commandments. They could go no further than him, folks. They could rise no higher than the Son of God. If anyone tells you you need Christ plus a commandment, we've got a problem, a big one. For if a man think himself to be something when he is, what? Now, I hate to uh, make you mad. You mean this house is full of nothings? That's right. And you got a big nothing up here preaching to you. Well, then that means we're relying on someone else. That's right. Someone a whole lot bigger than us. When he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work. And then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. That in itself is a great understanding lesson in context, but that's not what I'll be talking about today. Notice verse 2, bear one another's burdens. Verse number 5, bear your own burden. There's a message in that. But look at verse 6. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. For be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Let the Bible define the flesh. But he that soweth to the Spirit, notice in my Bible it's a capital S, is it in yours? All right, the Greek word is pneuma. Declension is pneuma, pneumatos. Pneuma, Spirit, Spirit of God, shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Father, bless this word now and give me the unction to preach it. Lord, don't let me get up here and make a fool out of myself. Present me and preach Lawson. Let me preach Christ. Let me glorify the Son of God. In your holy name, amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> this, I can tell, I'm sure you can tell by now, is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. I like, uh, I have great respect, I have far more respect for the man with a compass and with a, and with a plane and with a, uh, uh, you know, uh, something that builds a trowel, then I have a man with a sledgehammer. There's a big difference between the two. There's, a, there's the one who tears down and the one who builds up. It takes skill to be able to build. It takes training and work and, air, and effort. To tear down, oh, that's easy to do. Just hand Hand a man a sledgehammer, and he can begin to tear down. The Apostle Paul says, if a, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual. Now here we have people in the church, therefore, that are called to certain ministries. 1 Corinthians 12 will give you a list of the gifts of the Spirit, and you find them throughout the New Testament. It's important to understand that you're not called to do everything. And you're not called to minister in areas. May you, you may see someone else do it and you think, well, if he can do it, I can do it. Not necessarily. You have to be equipped for that ministry. You have to be prepared for it. That's just why the Apostle Paul tells you plainly here uh, that you must rejoice in your own work, in himself alone. Prove his own work. Therefore, you rejoice with God. You know that you're in the calling God's put you in. You see, you don't just choose to preach the word of God. I know some folks think, that well, it's just another profession. Well, for that one, it is a profession, and that's all it'll ever be. But if you're called of God, 
There's going to be a communication between you and the Lord. There's going to be a burden upon your soul. There's going to be a message for the people. And this is what needs to be done today. Oh, how sorely do we need a message from God? But don't you notice how that we have those who are restorers? Now, I don't know how many restorers we have here at Temple, but we certainly need more. You got to, this is one thing. It's like prayer. You can never have too many of these restorers, those who who want to help those who have a sense of discernment about them. A restorer, first of all, would absolutely be someone who understands the nature of the, the fight. He understands the nature. He understands the weapons that are arrayed against him, he or she. A restorer is someone, therefore, who certainly has a relationship with the Lord and is walking in fellowship with God. A restorer is going to be one in the congregation that's going to be your friend. They're not going to come to kick you down or stomp you while you are down. They're going to come to help you. And they're going to come because God sends them. And that's their ministry. God help us. May God bless the restorers. Amen. For everyone I've ever known, I rejoice in them. And may God bring more into our lives. And we praise God for all of the restorers. And those of you who like sledgehammers, you're one of the, one of the stone throwers. You notice how they didn't have any problem picking up the stones to cast at this woman drugged before them in adultery. I'm sure their self-righteous pride got pumped up that day. They compared themselves with this pole soul lying in the dirt. I mean, look at her. And surely they said to themselves, in no way would I ever be found in something like this. Of course, and maybe a week or two before that, he or might have been one of her clients or whatever. Who knows? But the bottom line is that uh, it's easy to be a stone thrower. But the restorer is a different uh, ministry entirely. Now, what does a restorer do? Well, now, here's a important. This is important. A lot of people get the idea here in Galatians chapter number six, six to restore means to bring someone out of a fault of sin, something that has taken hold of them, overcome them, and drugged them down, and it is just destroying their lives. That's true. There's certainly no question about that. That is definitely in the text. But there's more to life than that. There are those who have been beat down. There are those who have been abandoned. There are those who have been stabbed in the back. There are those who have had their friends turn against them of no fault of their own. And it has nothing to do with sin. It has to do, though, with the fact that they are away from God. This town is full of what we would call casualties. That's a kind of a technical term, you know, like collateral damage, you say. The bomb drops, it uh, bomb has no conscience, it kills whatever is within its reach. And women and children, the innocent, those non-combatants and all, well, they die too. No, that's collateral damage. The church has a lot of collateral damage too. Outside, there's a lot of collateral damage. There are people out there that have been hurt, folks. They've been hurt deeply. They've been hurt very deeply. 45 years ago, there was a man up in the pulpit. I used to go hear him preach, and he preached. He preached hard. He preached hard. He'd open the Bible, and he'd, and he'd, and he'd preach. He'd sweat, and he'd pour his soul out to God. Then his wife left him, ran off with another man. His home was all broken to pieces. I mean, torn up, and I'm sure he got down on his knees somewhere and cried his soul out. And he closed his Bible and never preached again. Never preached again. Never preached again. This is one of the people I'm talking about. This is a broken life, you see. And I don't know to this day, I haven't seen him in some time, but that was a long time ago and I'll never forget it because I was new here. That's about 45 years ago. I've only been here a couple of years and I was still, you know, in the, really in the learning stage. I'm still learning, but my goodness, everything was new back then. And I was watching this, watching that, hearing this, hearing that. I felt so sorry for him. I felt real bad for him because... You see, this happens to people. We had it happen here at Temple. We're here at Temple Baptist Church. A young man came in. He's up teaching, teaching the Bible. First thing you know, his wife runs off <laughs> with another man. And, uh, and, and I, I remember his face, how torn up he was. I mean, it just destroyed him on the inside. Just tore him down. And I thought to myself, my goodness gracious. I, you know, I hadn't been here long either at that time. And I thought, good night, man. Is this what we can expect? Is this what's going to happen here? It's as bad as it is on Fifth Avenue. And they're running off and leaving their families and, and uh, you know, fornicating and adultery and all the rest of that. But it does happen. I've seen it happen over and over and over and over and over again. And so what do you do? Kick them down? No, I try to help people. That's what I do. 
Because a lot of times you don't realize how strong sin is and how weak your flesh can become. It can become very weak. Amen. And this is why the apostle says, consider thyself also. That word consider there, that's a, that, that's a, that's a pretty heavy duty word. It, it's that, it means to really examine yourself uh, in the faith, uh, to really look deep within your soul, to, uh, to um, say, God, uh, uh, what am I really? Talk to the Lord and say, Lord, uh, you know, I, we're awful good at projecting images, aren't we? But you see, God's a good God. He'll let you get to where you find out who you really are <laughs> and forget the image. And that's the one you live with, the one that God lets you know who you really are. And that's what you're dealing with. And this is why I want to help people this morning. I want to help them. I want to help them. It's easy to get up in the pulpit and rear back and start kicking and stomping. I mean, preach against sin. Okay, well, let's name them. All right, you've got, you got a year. You got a year? How about a year and a half? You see, I'm not for sin, believe me. Believe me, I am not condoning any sin. But there's always this business of when somebody starts preaching against sin, it's always this list. You ever notice how they've got a list memorized? The truth of the matter is, you without sin cast the first stone. So what does it mean? It means that somewhere around, somewhere before God, there's got to be enough grace of God for, for, for this house full of sinners to live with each other. Can we get along? <laughs> Can we get along? Whatever your besetting sin might be may not be my besetting sin. I may not have any trouble with it at all. But what I have trouble with, you may not have any trouble with. So what do you do with it? You crawl before God with it. And say, God, cleanse me. Help me. And then the Lord said, I'm going to tell you what, son. I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to cleanse you. And I'm going to prepare you to help somebody else. Because this town's full of churches. You don't want to fall in some of these churches. Because if you do, they'll kill you. You fall around a legalist. And that's the worst place in this world for you to fall and backslide. That legalist will consume you. But I've also seen the legalist fall. They can't handle it. A lot of times they'll blow their brains out because they couldn't live up to their standards. Well, let me tell you the standard to live up to is Christ, not something you wrote down somewhere. He's the standard. Judge yourself by the Son of God. When I preach like this, people think, well, that Lawson's up there is con condoning. I'm not condoning anything. God's not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. What I'm trying to do is to tell you how to find victory. I'm trying to show you how to get victory. I'm trying to show you how to live in this world. I've been here a while. I know people. You know, don't kid me. I know people. There are people that would never commit adultery, but they would assassinate your character in a heartbeat. With their tongue, they would destroy you. But they would never commit adultery. They wouldn't take a drink of this, or they wouldn't say this or that. Boy, they would, they were vicious with their tongues. How many agree with me? I'm glad we got over that hurdle. <laughs> I used to run hurdles in high school. I did. High hurdle. 120 yard high hurdle. We ran against Fulton High School. I don't know why everybody hated everybody back then, but anyway. We ran, we, I, I ran against Fulton High School. I was ahead. I mean, tell you, I was, I was ahead, man. I mean, I was coming up on the last hurdle. I was ahead. I was winning this race. And I got my cleats caught in that last hurdle and flipped me on. And I got up and still came in second. That's how far ahead I was. But hurdles will flip you, boy. So you get over the hurdle. I'm glad we got over that hurdle. Ain't no righteous people in here. Remember the Lord Jesus said, I came not to call the righteous, but what? To repentance. You mean to tell me he believed some people were righteous? No. If you weren't here Wednesday night, I talked about it Wednesday night. Remember what he said? He said, he that is without sin cast the first stone. What did he just say to them? Every one of you are sinners. He was dealing with an issue and a principle. The Bible's like that. The Bible is like that. It says something to get you to think, to put your mind into it. We got people with broken lives. We've got people with shipwrecked faith. It's shipwrecked. 
They've listened to some heretic and he's destroyed them, drug them off into some place out here in town where they deny the deity of Christ. It happens. It happens. I've heard him say that the Baptist church is the greatest mission field in Knoxville. <laughs> what a thing to say. Now, I agree that probably not a Baptist church in Knoxville doesn't have some problems here or there, the people teaching this or that. But the truth of the matter is, the Baptist church that I belong to right here, as long as I'm the overseer here, by the grace of God, we're going to stick with the book. Amen. Stick as close as we can with the book. Amen. I believe the Bible. You know I do. Then there are those that are running from God. Are you one of them? Demas ran from God and so did Jonah. See, there are people out there. They need to be restored. They're running from God. That's a pretty dumb soul, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, to think you can run from God. Jonah did. He bought a ticket to Tarshish and away he went. And he was running from God. Now, a lot of men, and I, I'm having no problem under, believing this, God called me to preach and I ran for 10 years, they say. Well, I, that happens. I'm sure it does. Call to preach is a scary thing. I sweat blood that first day, boy, when that pastor told me, got up that morning, said, God's called me to preach. All right, son, you preach this evening. Oh, Mark. <laughs> Phew. <laughs> oh, I mean, <laughs> until you've done it. <laughs> That first time, boy, oh, my hands were icy cold and I was scared to death and shaken from top to bottom. I got up and preached that first sermon. But it, you get over it. You get over it. So, young man, if God's called you to preach, quit running. Answer the call. Answer the call. Answer the call. You're not going to be happy. You're not going to have peace till you answer the call to preach. Amen. Amen, and don't leave it up to a man to confirm or affirm or whatever, whether you're called to preach or not. That's between you and God. You get that issue settled. If God's called you, you'll know it. You'll know it. And you can't run. You can run till you drop, and you cannot get away from it. And I like those kind of preachers. I do. And it doesn't bother me that you ran. That doesn't bother me a bit. Because that shows me how serious it is in your soul. So if God calls you to preach and you're running right now, stop. You're not going to get anywhere. And come back and preach. If you're running from God because you've done something and you think you can hide and get away from it, you can't. You can't. You can't. Be not deceived. God's not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Harvest day is the worst day, not the sowing day. It's when the harvest comes in. And then there are those that are confused. The people confused out here. You've got every kind of a doctrine in the world. They're confused. They don't know. Jeremiah said, ever since I got up and started preaching your word, been nothing but problems, people talking back to me, everything's gone wrong, so I'm not going to preach anymore. I'm done with you. The Lord said, okay, shut up and sit down. <laughs> but there's something inside you, Jeremiah, and you can't get away from it. So what's that? It's word. That's in me. Oh, how it is in me. And it's in you if you, if you know the Lord. And Jeremiah said his word was in me like a burning fire. Oh, I couldn't stop. I couldn't. And he had to speak. That's the word of God. It's alive. I don't want to be scary with you this morning, but I do want to scare you. If you believe the Bible and receive the word of God, something came alive into you. Something is alive in you. <laughs> something inside you is alive. It's a different life from your life. It's a living thing. And it's never going to leave you. And that word which is alive is going to stay in you until you leave this world. So you might as well get used to it. You've got the living word of God in you. Then you've got fatalism. What is that? People sitting by the pool of Bethesda. Remember that guy? Pool of, what, what does fatalism mean? Well, fatalism to me means that somebody said, well, I've given up hope. I've tried. I've prayed. I can't get victory over my sin. I've, you know, I've done everything I know to do. I know that's the problem. You're doing it. That's the problem. This book, when it comes to certain things, is so simple. Yet we try to make it so hard. Religion always has its way of getting in the middle. Yes, it does. Fatalism says that, well, I've crossed God's deadline and he can't forgive me anymore. You know, I've asked too many times. I've I, God's forgiven me and forgiven me and I've gone right back out and done the same thing again and again and again and again. Let me tell you something about his blood, folks. It cleanses from all sin. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Well, the one thing in that New Testament where he said there's neither forgiveness in this world or the world to come was not what you said about Christ. 
If you go back and read that text carefully, it's not what you said about Christ. It's what the Holy Ghost had been doing to you and you had turned from the power of the Holy Spirit of God to convict you as to who Christ was. And when you do that, there's nowhere left to go, folks. When he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he'll guide you into all truth. The Holy Spirit of God turned off. There's no hope. And when you do that, when you do that, then that's what's called the unpardonable sin. Have you done that? I don't think there's anybody in this house that's done that. Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. Then you may say, well, I'm finished. A lot of preachers get here. They're like that. They say, I'm done. I've pastored three or four churches, and I can't get anything done. I'm finished. You know, they're all failures. You've tried to live for the Lord. Finished. You're a Sunday school teacher. You're finished. Everything you've tried to do for God is just a failure. On and on and on. You realize that God may have to have you fail a, th a dozen times before victory can really come because he has so much of you that has to fail before he can do something with what's left of you. Do you realize how old Mo Moses was? He was 80 years old. He had failed and failed and failed. He was 80 years old, folks, in Midian, watching over sheep. And when that bush started burning and God appeared to him, 80. He, Moses' life can be broken up into three distinct periods of 40 years. First 40, second 40, third 40. When he came back into Egypt, he lived another 40 years. 40 years, folks. He was 80 years old. When people would think you're about ready to quit, that's when God started with him. I don't care how many times you've failed. I don't, I don't care how many times you've put your hand to the plow and it didn't work. How many times you've said you're going to do something for God and it just all blew up in your face. How many times you've said, I'm going to tell you something, Satan will be right there to scream into your ear. You're no good. You're a failure. It'll never get done. You can't do it. It's over. It's over. It's over. It's over. Let me tell you something. You are over, but God just starts. Amen. 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 Moses went back, and you know who Moses is to this very day. Moses in the Bible, to me, is one of the greatest men that ever lived. Amen. I'll always lift up Moses. He was a man, a wonderful man, no question about it. But he was a man like us, like us. And then finally, some of you are going to be like the prodigal. You're going to have a wake-up call from God. You're going to have a wake-up call. It'll be time then to restore you. And you, you're waiting you know, you know you've done something. You know it's not right. You know, you, you know whatever it is. I'm not your judge. Listen, I'm not God's policeman, and I'm not God's district attorney. <laughs> I'm not the prosecuting attorney, and I'm not the law. I'm a preacher, a minister of the gospel to reach out to you, to preach the truth to you, to help you. Amen. I want to help you, folks. We'll go home tonight and sit down and think, well, I got this one, and I got that one. You ever hear a preacher talking about where God got this one and God got that one? Tune him off and get away from him. He's preaching, spewing out death. God's not out to get you. The Bible said, if God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, how shall he not freely give us all things? He's for us, folks. God's for us. So how do you restore? This is what's important. It's not from falling, into, as I said to you a moment ago, it's not always from falling into sin. Is some of these issues that you're dealing with. Now, here's the person who is a restorer, and I'll just give you a few things, and we'll, and we'll come to a close. Number one, you must be accepted as genuine to that person. In other words, God has given us a sense about us. Children especially have a, have a, have a better sense of it than adults. What's that? Children can tell if you care anything about them. The reason? They're vulnerable. They can that's why I love my grandfather, because he loved me. And I knew it in the midst of all of the rest of the family. I knew that one old man loved me, and I love him to this day. Think about him all the time. He showed me love. A child showed me love. You'll know it. Now, if that person really does care about you, all right, then they've met the first criteria for restoring you. Are you out there? Are you languishing? Do you not know where to go? Do you, are you just falling apart? You know, you're fed up with religion. I am too. Fed up with churches. I am too. Fed up with fake, phony smiles. Fake this, fake that. I am too. But you see, I got to get up here and minister to you. 
So what do I do? I've got to get a hold of God. And see, this is where I can help a pastor because I go through what pastors go through. And I know and I understand. Let me tell you something. 99 times out of 100, when it comes between taking the pastor's side or the side of the deacon board or this crowd or that crowd, I'm going to take that pastor's side. Now, that's not always the case. Sometimes you've got a sorry, low-down piece of garbage, and he needs to go. All pastors aren't perfect. But the truth of the matter is, most of them are men of God that are trying to do God's work. And they'll fail, and they'll come up short. They'll miss the mark. And I think they understand when a veteran pastor like me, I've been at this a long time, they understand that I understand. And that's what's important about all of this. They understand that I understand. You must have empathy. If you're going to help somebody, now what's empathy? Well, have, how many have heard of empathy and sympathy? All right. Well, they're not synonymous. They sound the same, but there's a little bit of a difference. What is it? Here's sympathy. Sympathy, sympathy you feel sorry for someone's sorrow. You feel sorry for the pain. You can feel it. Okay? You feel it. Well, that's a good thing. That means you're not a psychopath. <laughs> You see somebody suffering and it bothers you. You pray for them. You pour your soul out for them. But here's empathy. Empathy not only feels sorrow for them. Empathy has the ability to begin to understand you. Empathy is a little higher up than sympathy. Empathy means that, yes, and I can understand what's going on when inside your soul and inside your heart and inside your mind. I understand your life has turned into a living hell. That's empathy. Now, that's what the restorer needs. The restorer needs empathy. Sympathy's fine. It's all, that's all good. But that restorer needs empathy. All right? Number three, the restorer needs to be conscious and of all things conscious of grace versus law. Yes, you do. If you're going to help somebody that's fallen into sin or their life is a mess or they've been beaten down and, you know, they're looking for a friend. Does anybody in the house, does anybody care? You want my money? <laughs> a lot of these people, all you talk about is money. No, we don't want your money. We want to give you Christ. Money and the rest of that stuff will take its place. It'll all work out. There's, no, there's never, never an issue with that. Lord... Did you know the Lord never carried a dollar bill all the days of his life? And the only time he ever needed money, how'd he get it? Now I'm thinking the other day, when did that fish get that money? Wonder how long, wonder, wonder, wonder how long that fish swam around with that money. You know, who knows? Nobody, nobody knows. I mean, one day that might have fallen down to the bottom. Fish went over there and snapped it up. Could have been a bottom sucker, you know, whatever. And then carried that and carried it and carried it until he needed it. And up it came. And he got it. He didn't care anything about money. Christ didn't care one bit about money. He overthrew the money changers in the temple. Money will come. Don't worry about the money. It'll come. It always has. But you see, you've got to understand that you have to, you, the difference between grace and law is this. Grace says, I know what you're doing is wrong. And I'm not condoning what you're doing. But I have enough empathy about me to understand that you are probably hooked. You are bound. You're addicted to something. And we're not just going to shut it down overnight. That it's going to take some time. And it's going to take some love. It's going to take some caring to get you through what you need to get through. And I'm going to stick with you however long it takes. You see, there may be steps ahead and then fall back. You may... You may, you may get some victory, but then back set. That happens, folks, especially with drug addicts. That happens. That happens. They don't need somebody up in the pulpit stomping them down. Listen, if you're a drug addict, you know you need help. And I don't know who is in this house is a drug addict. Thanks be unto God that I never got into that, but that doesn't, make me, that doesn't mean anything. It just wasn't part of my culture when I grew up. If it had been, I'd probably been laying out here on the side of the road somewhere. So, you know, I'm not saying I'm one bit better than anybody. And uh, when it comes to drug addiction, you need somebody who has been in it. That would make the best one. You realize that a sinner is the best person to help restore a sinner? You realize that? A sinner that has been restored themselves. 
There's no greater person on this earth than a sinner to help another sinner because you understand. I know. I understand that. And that's what we're talking about. You want to see somebody restored? I'd like to see them restored, wouldn't you? Let me tell you why this is important. The culture you live in today, folks, is rotten and spiraling downward. It is. It's the other day, this kid picks up a gun, 17 years old, and he blows. He kills some little kid, four, five, six years old, then eventually winds up killing himself. This happens all the time, all the time. The culture is, is, is free falling. So what are we supposed to do here? What's Temple Baptist Church for? What are we sitting over here? What's this building for? Why do we heat this place? What's the light for? If this is not a sanctuary, and I'm not talking about sanctu hypocritical sanctuary cities. We're not going to get into politics today, but Lord have mercy. But it is a sanctuary for the sinner. It's a sanctuary for the fallen. It's a sanctuary for those that need help. If you need help, this should be the place you can come to to get help. It should not be a place if you come down here and you get down this altar and you, and you come in here with a load of baggage and all kinds of problems. Pour your soul out to God and even begin to openly confess some of the things that you've done. And you've got to be careful with stuff like that because people can't handle stuff like that. If you've got some stuff that you've been doing, so I'm talking maybe it's vile, wicked stuff, you tell it to God, Amen. but not to a man. Amen. They don't need to hear it. They don't need to hear it. You tell it to the Lord. You tell it to the Lord. He'll take care. He won't throw it in your face. He won't beat you to death with it. But the truth of the matter is, once you've done that, once you've done that, you should be able to turn around in this place and find people that are willing to accept you and receive you and pray with you and help you. They should be mature enough to know, I'm not condoning the life that you've lived or are living, but I want to help get you out of it. That's what a restorer does. And that's what I'm trying to get across to you. And then this one is important. You must be patient. Psalm 106, verse 13. Here's what he says. Psalm 106, verse 13. They soon forgot his words. They waited not for his counsel. Young people especially are, are prone to be impatient. Patience is important with God. Why? Because timing is important with God. When he gets ready to do something, he does it when he wants to do it, where he wants to do it, how he wants to do it. God does that. In the fullness of time, God brought forth his son made of a woman made under the law. Time is important with God. You say, well, I'd like to see it get done. Well, you may like to, but the thing is, God's got to be the one that does it. It takes time, all right? So do you have the patience to spend with somebody? Is there anybody in Temple Baptist Church this morning that would get on their face and say, Lord God, I know that you've called me and I'm not exactly sure what you've called me to do, but I know that your, your hand's on my life, and I know you want me to do something. You might be the very one I'm talking to right now. You might be a restorer. You might have that kind, generous, forgiving heart where you can help someone who needs help. They deeply need help. Are you? Are you? The Bible said in Psalm 130, verse number 3, here's what it says. Psalm 130, verse 3. If thou, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? Think about that. And then finally, you must be there. The scripture says in Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16, A just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. How many of you have ever now don't, have to, don't raise your hand. But God's forgiven you of a sin. And you were serious as you could be about it. You meant you were serious. He forgave you. And you rejoiced. And then the first thing you know, you wind up doing it again. Happens, doesn't it? Of course it does. It happens. It happens. Well, what do you do? Well, you get back up. Then you get back up. Then you get back up. Then you get back up. And you'll find out when you're down who your friends are. You'll find out real fast who they are. Well, finally, 
This is how you deal with these issues. They're simple things. Don't get complicated. When the thief on the cross looked over at the Lord Jesus, he said, Lord, remember me. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying this. I don't know what you've done. I don't know what you've done. And you don't have to tell me what you've done. Huh. This is where this business of confessional booths, auricular confession, Catholic Church has all this stuff. Forget that garbage. There's no man on this earth that can take in all this confession. Can't handle it. <clears throat> Tell it to God. Tell it to the Lord. Confess it to him. Confess it to him. But here's the thing. There's not a one of us in this house that can remember every sin we've ever committed. I can't do it. So what do you do? When the thief on the cross said, remember me, he was saying, Lord Jesus, here I am. This is me. I can't think of all the stuff I've done, but just remember me. Remember me, Lord. That's all you need to say. When you come to an altar, get on your knees, talk to the Lord. You want to get right with God? You want to start right? That's the way to start right. You don't have to remember and confess. And now if you do have something, the Holy Spirit is burning in your soul, confess it. But otherwise, Satan will beat you to death to make you think that you, well, you know, I, I don't, I didn't confess this or I didn't confess that. That's not the issue. The issue is that you came to him and trusted him to cleanse you. And that's all you have to do. Lord, remember me. Remember me when you're coming to your kingdom. If God be for us, who can be against us? Would you close your eyes for a moment, bow your heads? Now, Father... Lord, you know, I, I'm just a preacher. That's all I am. I'm a messenger. I'm up here to give out your word. But if somebody needed to hear that, I don't know who they were. It really doesn't, it really, it really doesn't uh, become an issue with me. It's between you and them. But Father, I would like to see them take that first step today in restoration and simply come to you and simply acknowledge a simple thing. Lord, remember me. And at that, we'll start the process of what it will take to restore them. They've tried, they've tried, they've failed, they've failed, they've tried, they've failed. But that doesn't mean that they're a failure. That simply means that they're on the road to forgiveness and victory. And I pray for them. I pray for them in Jesus' name today. And for his sake, I ask it. Heads are bowed. Uh, nobody's looking. This is a private thing. But I want to pray for you. If you want to acknowledge this morning that first step where you'll say, Lord, remember me, remember me, and we'll take it on from there. Nobody's going to come back and tap you on the shoulder. Nobody's going to drag you to the altar. I'm going to pray for you. And I am not, this is, this is I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a bishop and an elder. I'm an ordained minister of the gospel. I have a privilege in that in the sense that I don't have a right to take what you and the issue that you have between you and God where I enter into that and get up and, and broadcast that to other people. That's a private matter. So if you want to raise your hand this morning and say, Preacher Lawson, I want you to pray for me because I want to acknowledge it. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Well, we got hands everywhere here now. God bless you. Thank the good Lord. Amen. 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 God bless your soul. Father. Lord, you saw the hands that went up. And Father, we have one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Lord, there is no way that I try to step into that place where the Lord Jesus is the mediator. But I can intercede. And Father, I intercede as a minister of the gospel for them that what they did this morning will, begin, will be the beginning of that move back toward thee, Father. And whatever you choose to do, however you choose to do it, to restore such an one, and the restoration in whatever sense it is, it may, not have, it may have nothing to do with sin. It may have to do completely with a battle that's being fought or whatever. But I pray for them. I pray for them. I pray for them now. Let the Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus, let your Holy Ghost come down upon them and touch them and move them and bring them from darkness into light in, the, in this victory that they need in this area. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's stand up and sing.